In this video, we're going to look at a concept called Le Chatelier's Principle. And Le Chatelier's Principle focuses on this idea of how does changing the reaction conditions affect the equilibrium mixture. So what we have to remember is that um, these equilibria are dynamic. So uh, at, even though an equilibrium mixture is sitting there and the concentrations aren't changing, that doesn't mean that things aren't happening. Um, what's happening is, is that the forward and reverse reactions are still taking place. They're just taking place at the same rate. So, you know, products are being converted to reactants and reactants are being converted to products. And because of this, a reaction can respond to changes in concentration, temperature, uh, pressure, or like a catalyst, for example. So we're going to look at each one of these different possibilities in turn. So the first example is, you know, adding or removing reactants or products. And the example reaction that we're going to use throughout this is um, we're going to use this example of CO plus uh, 3H2 goes back and forth with CH4 plus H2O gas. And so we can kind of think about some different things um, in this case. So let's think about, let's kind of set up an, an objective. Now, oftentimes in when we use Le Chatelier's principle, it's not just a matter of sort of thinking about conceptually how we can perturb a reaction, but it's more about thinking specifically about how we can target the production of a one of the various products or reactants, right? Normally, it's targeting the production of a specific product. So, uh, for example, when you're making uh, medications and um, or you know, and you have these very complex, long processes where there are many different steps in the production of, like, for example, an antibiotic or a pharmaceutical, you may have four or five synthetic steps where you're going to get an equilibrium. And those four or five synthetic steps are going to only produce a small amount of the product that you want um, because you have this equilibrium mixture. So the question that a lot, oftentimes chemists will ask themselves is how can we drive a reaction to make more of this knowing that, you know, we're going to be at equilibrium and we want to drive this equilibrium in the specific direction to, to make a specific reactant or product. So, for example, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the question, how can we, how can we make more CH4? And so let's start thinking about this from the concept of adding or removing reactants or products. So in this case, if we want to drive the reaction to making more CH4, we want to drive this reaction to uh, the right. So we want to start to favor, we want to favor the, um, the forward direction. And to favor the forward direction, what we would need to do is we would need to have the case where Q is less than K. So we're going to have to do something where we make Q become less than K. And what this means is that we have too few products and we have too many reactants. So the reaction is going to want to drive forward. So the question is, is how can we make Q less than K? So a couple of things we could do is if we want to make Q less than K, and K in this case is equal to the concentration of CH4 times the concentration of H2O divided by the concentration of CO times the concentration of H2 cubed. So one possibility would be we, to give it too many reactants. So what we could do is we could add CO or H2. And if we do that, if we add CO or H2, that's going to make the bottom go up. And this is going to make the Q become less than K, and the reaction will go forward. Another possibility is we could take away some water. So if we decrease the amount of water that's in there, let's say that we dry the mixture out and we take water away, that's also going to push the reaction forward. Because if you think about it, if you decrease the amount of water, the Q is going to go down relative to Q. So whether we increase the left side or decrease the water, either one of those is going to push the equilibrium out of balance and, and make it favor more CH4. And the way that I like to think of this is as a balance, right? So if you have the left and the right side in equilibrium, if you pump up the left side by adding stuff to it, that's going to make it, the reaction go out of balance. You're going to have too much of the reactants and too little of the product. So the reaction is going to want to go forward to balance that out. And then it's going to make some products and use up some reactants and push it to the right. The other way of thinking about this is if you take away water on the right side, we're going to unbalance the reaction again. We're going to lower the right side relative to the left, and then the left is going to want to go to the right and make some products. So in this case, our possibilities for making more CH4 would be to add CO or H2 or remove water. So we can generalize this where we have um, some general rules. 
So if we add reactants or decrease products, which is the case here, uh, we're going to favor the forward and we're going to make products. This is the case where Q is less than K. If we add products or decrease reactants, we're going to favor the reverse. And we're going to make reactants. And so in this case, Q is greater than K. So in this example, we have an equilibrium where we have a uh, Iron solid plus uh, water gas gives iron oxide plus uh, H2 gas. So if we write down our K in this case, K is going to equal the concentration of H2 cubed divided by the concentration of H2O cubed. And that's going to be our K expression. So what's interesting about this is um, if we want to perturb the equilibrium, we would have to either perturb the H2 or the H2O. If we add or subtract iron from this reaction, uh, that will have no effect on the equilibrium mixture, but we do have to have iron and iron oxide in there in order to allow the equilibrium to continue. So let's take a look at some changes. So the, the gaseous equilibrium mixture is exposed to molecular sieve, which absorb water gas. So the, the question is basically saying, if we take away some water, What's going to happen to this reaction? Is it going to pref is it going to prefer the uh, the forward or the reverse direction? So in this case, if we decrease the concentration of water by absorbing it and taking it out of the equilibrium mixture from molecular sieves, we're going to favor the reverse direction of this reaction. So this one is going to be the reverse. Now let's look at what would happen if hydrogen gas were added. So if we add hydrogen gas to the mixture to the the vessel, that's going to pump up the right-hand side, and again, it's going to push the reaction to the reverse. And then let's like, take a look at the last one. So an experimenter adds some extra iron filings to the reaction. So if we increase the iron in this case, uh, it's necessary for the reaction to take place, but it's not going to affect the equilibrium mixture because the equilibrium mixture only depends on the hydrogen and the water. So this is going to have no effect because it's a solid. Okay, so let's look at the second example. So this is where we are going to look at how we can uh, how we can perturb a equilibrium that involves gases by changing the pressure. So let's ask the question: If we have this equ this mixture and it's at equilibrium, and we decrease the volume by a half, in essence, we just contract this thing down. And when you decrease the volume by a half, we know from gas laws that that's going to double our pressure because they're inversely related. So in essence, we're doubling the pressure of each one of these components. So the question becomes, what is that going to do to the equilibrium, if anything at all? So if we write down our Q in this case, um, and we can set this up mathematically, but there is a general rule that simplifies this a little bit. So let's just look at it mathematically so that we're kind of all on the same page. So we have CH4 over H2O divided by CO, and then we have H2 uh, cubed. So let's think about what would happen if we doubled the pressure. So if we doubled the pressure and we, we multiplied our concentrations at, uh, so let's say that we, we have an, a mixture at equilibrium and it has a certain number of concentrations and then we doubled each one of those. So we put a two, a two, a two, and then we put a two. And remember that's gonna be a two cubed that goes in there. So we double the pressure of each one of these or we double the concentration by decreasing the volume by a half. So what we're going to get is on top, we're going to get a factor of 4 increase. And on the bottom, we're going to get a factor of 2 times 2 cubed. Uh, so 2 cubed is, is uh, 8 times 2 is 16. So what we're going to get is we're going to get uh, a value of 1 fourth times the original value of K. So in essence, what we just did was we made Q become less than K by changing the pressure. And so in this case, the reaction is going to go in the forward direction. Now that's a little bit complicated, I know, and this is probably not something that you're going to want to do on the fly, right? You're not going to want to be plugging in twos and things like that. Let's just think of this conceptually, because I think this might make a lot more sense. On the left side, 
we have uh, four moles of gas. And on the right side, we only have two moles of gas. So if on the left side we have four moles of gas, and on the right side we have two moles of gas, and we shrink this thing down, what's going to happen is as you shrink it down, we're going to increase the pressure of all of these things. But because the left side has more moles of gas, we're going to increase the overall pressure of the left side more than we're going to increase the pressure on the right side, right? Because we know that pressure is proportional to the number of moles. So that means that, in essence, the, the left-hand side is going to become more concentrated and therefore is going to be unbalanced. That side is going to go up in terms of concentration relative to the right. So what we're going to see is that that, that is going to favor this reaction to go in the forward direction. So the general rule... is that an increase in pressure uh, will shift the reaction to the side with fewer moles of gas. Right, So we just showed that here. On the left side, we have four moles. On the right side, we have two moles. When we increase the pressure, we're making those four moles more concentrated relative to the two moles. So that's going to push this in the forward direction. It's going to want to balance that out by reducing some of those moles of gas on the left side. So that's the general rule. Okay, so let's look at an example of this and see if we can continue to use this to make some predictions. So can you increase the yield of products in the following reactions by decreasing the volume of the vessel? So remember, if we decrease the volume of the vessel, we're going to increase pressure. And so what we're looking for is, if we're increasing pressure, we're looking to see in which direction are these going to be going in. So the first one has two moles of gas on the left. It has two moles of gas on the right. So increasing the pressure here is going to have no effect because we have the same number of moles on each side. So in this case, the answer is going to be no. We cannot increase the yield of the products because the increase in pressure is going to have no effect. Now let's look at this one. So we have zero moles of gas on the left. And we have one mole of gas on the right. And so if we increase the pressure, we're going to favor this direction of the reaction. So in this case, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to favor the reverse. And so therefore, again, we're going to have a no answer. We're not going to be able to increase the amount of products. So let's look at this one. In this one, we have three moles of gas on the left. We have two moles of gas on the right. So if we increase the pressure, we're going to favor the forward. And therefore, this one is going to favor forward. And the answer here is going to be yes. So the only one of these that's going to favor producing products is going to be the, the last one. Okay, so let's look at the last example, which is the effect of temperature on an equilibrium. So here we have our same reaction, and in this, in this case, we have, um, now we've added a delta H to this. So uh, in order to evaluate the effect of temperature, we do need to know the delta H for the reaction. So in this case, the delta H is equal to minus 206 kilojoules. So this is an exothermic reaction. And a good thing, a good way to approach these is, um, and kind of to sort of simplify this process, let's rewrite that delta H, but include that energy as a product of this reaction. So we have plus 206 kilojoules uh, of energy on the right-hand side. So now let's think about what would happen if we increased temperature. So would, the way that we have to think about this is if we increase temperature, we're basically increasing the energy available to the system. So now the question becomes, if we increase the energy available to, this, to the system, which side will that benefit? Which side in this case needs energy? So uh, that's what we kind of have to think about. So in this case, if you look at it, because this is an exothermic reaction, the energy is a product of this reaction. So uh, to go in the left-hand direction, this going in this direction, this requires energy. This needs energy to take place. Whereas in the other direction, it does not need energy. So if we give the system energy, it's going to favor the direction that needs the energy, right? So we're, it's basically like thinking of the energy as a reactant 
and by giving it uh, by giving it an increase in temperature, we're giving it the energy it needs in order for that reaction to go uh, forward. So, uh, increasing temperature, the general rule here, will always favor the endothermic process. And the reason for this is because in an endothermic process, energy is needed. Whereas in an exothermic process, energy is uh, given off as a product. So it will always favor the endothermic side. So if in the case of increasing temperature in an exothermic, this is going to favor the reverse. And if we increase temp in the case of a endothermic reaction, this is going to favor the forward direction. And so uh, that's how you can think of this. Basically, the side that needs the energy, the endothermic side, is going to win. So in an exothermic reaction, the endothermic process is going to be the reverse and that's the one that's going to win out. In an endothermic reaction the uh, the forward direction is the one that needs the energy so that's the one that's going to start to win out as we increase temperature. Okay so in this example we have carbon monoxide is formed when carbon dioxide reacts with solid carbon uh, graphite. Uh, should the reaction be performed at a high temperature or a low temperature to favor the, the production of carbon monoxide? And so the delta H in this case is a uh, is, is a positive 175.2 kilojoules. So if we rewrite this equation where we have CO2 plus carbon plus 175.2 kilojoules is in equilibrium with CO gas, we can see that the endothermic side is the forward direction. So in this case, if we want to make this go toward products uh, and we want to favor the production of carbon monoxide, we want to know how can we push this in the forward direction. So if we want to favor the endothermic side, we should increase the temperature. So increasing the temp in this case will increase the rate of the endothermic, which is the forward, and that will produce more CO. So this is going to shift right. And let's look at this concept question. If the reaction was, is started with only CO2 and graphite, what effect will increasing the temperature have on the rate at which the reaction reaches equilibrium? And so this is, this is kind of looping in stuff that we already saw from, um, from chapter 13. So we know that generally speaking, as we increase temperature, we increase rate. So if we increase the temp, not only will this shift the direction in the right-hand side, but it's going to make the, it's going to increase the rate at which that takes place, right? Because remember, temperature is proportional. Um, we, we have a relationship between uh, temperature and the rate constant and as uh, the temperature goes up the rate constant also goes up and that's because of those kinetic arguments where we have more collisions and things like that um, so in this case the the reaction will get to that equilibrium faster because it's at a higher temp so we're going to get more collisions and more reaction okay so our final example is going to be what happens if we add a catalyst to a reaction and so if we take our CO plus 3H2 gives CH4 and H2O example, and we add a catalyst to this, we have to go back to 13, chapter 13 to remember what catalysts do. So what effect does a catalyst have on a reaction? And the first thing is we have to remember that catalysts are, neither cons are not consumed in the reaction. They, just, they, they, they are present and they act to facilitate the reaction, but they don't actually, they're not actually a product or a reactant. So they don't, they're not going to appear in the K equation. So just based on that, we can, we can kind of make an estimate that um, they're not really going to have any effect on anything. But also, if we look at this graph where we have our, this is our energy, and this is our reaction coordinate graph. And um, if we look, the, we know that catalysts act by lowering the activation energy. And uh, this right here is the activation energy barrier for these. And what you notice is that the catalyst lowers the activation energy, but it lowers the activation energy for both the forward and the reverse. So 
it has no effect on the equilibrium. It just allows the equilibrium to get there faster. So, you know, it makes the forward and reverse reactions go faster, but it doesn't actually affect the equilibrium mixture. It doesn't actually change the proportion of the methanol and water relative, the methane and water relative to the carbon monoxide and the H2. So, um, so catalysts lower EA. Um, equally for both the forward and reverse directions. And so they have no net effect on the equilibrium. So they have no Yeah, so catalysts have no effect on the equilibrium mixture, but they increase equally the rates of the forward and the reverse. So basically what happens is they speed up the forward and the reverse reactions, but it speeds them up at this, uh, so that it speeds them up the same um, so that they continue to remain equal. It's just that the, actual absolute values are higher than they were without the catalyst. So those are the various examples of what can happen when you perturb a equilibrium.